Hello, everybody, and welcome to our common myths about the GMAT webinar hosted by Magoosh and GMAC. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started in just a second. Uh, if you could let me know in the chat, can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you see our slideshow? got someone joining us from India at 1 30 in the morning thank My you goodness. so much for being here wow. we got some folks here in California <laughs> all right it looks like we are live okay it looks like folks are still joining us um, but thank you again so much for being here we're gonna go ahead and get started so again Hello and welcome to Common Myths About the GMAT. So we're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves. So hi, my name is Erica Tyler-John. I am the Senior Education Manager here at Magoosh. So what that means is that I think about our curriculum, I think about our lessons, I think about our questions, I think about our live classes, I think about how to best present this material to students to help them regardless of where they're at in their studies. Uh, so that's me, uh, I've been in test prep for a number of years. You may know me from my YouTube videos. I have a bunch of YouTube videos on a bunch of different channels. Um, I'm a 770 GMAT scorer. The GMAT is probably my favorite test. I teach a lot of them, but I really love the GMAT. Um, so I'm really excited to be doing this webinar today with Eric, and I'll go ahead and kick it over to Eric. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And, and uh, as you, again, as, my name is Eric Chambers. I'm with the market development team at, at GMAC, and, and my responsibilities are to you know, work with our schools that use our products and services and also, um, you know, do things like this, which are a lot of fun. So, um, you know, now, Eric, I, I, I don't have a 770 on the GMAT. So, you know, I, I, I bow to you um, <laughs> to do that. Um, uh, and also, you know, my kids are going to think I'm really cool because I'm, I'm on, a, on a call with a YouTuber. So <laughs> that's what they watch these days. So it's crazy. Anyway, but it's good to be here. Thanks again. Oh, well, we're, we're so happy to have you here. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. So today's webinar is gonna be focused on common myths about the GMAT. So these are things that we hear from GMAT test takers, from aspiring MBA students, things that they just get wrong about the GMAT exams. So we're gonna clear that up today um, using my test prep background and Eric's knowledge of GMAT. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start with um, GMAT myth number one, which is one that I hear a lot. Eric, do you hear this one often? We do. We've been hearing it for ever since I started at GMAC. Um, when, we, when we talk about myths, then we ask people to raise their hand and tell us about some of the ones they've heard. And this is inevitably one of the first ones that come up. So yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> I, I don't know where this one came from, but this is a very common myth. I have to address it to all of my students in all of my classes, but this myth is the first five to 10 questions are the most important to my score. So I get a lot of students who, who think that because of the way the test is designed, they really need to get the first five to 10 questions right. And because they think this, they end up spending so much time on these first five to 10 questions, spending five minutes on an individual question. And while they might perform well in those questions, they end up really running out of time and that causes them to struggle later in the section. So what is the truth? I'm gonna go ahead and kick it to Eric to explain this one. Yeah, so as you can see here, you know the first questions do not determine your score, right? They're no more critical than the, any of the other questions that are uh, you're gonna see throughout. And that's mainly because it's a computer adaptive exam. And, and, and after another myth here, we might show you what we mean by that. Um, but yeah, I, I would, uh, again, uh, you know, look at tips. Um, maybe as we're moving through this as well, as Erica said, you know, don't get so focused on trying to get every question right. Um, and don't get so hung up on a particular question. You know, at a certain point, you're just going to have to um, try to narrow it down and then guess and move on. Um, and again, we'll show you um, that the worst thing that happened to you all is, you know, if you just get it wrong, fine. You just get a little easier question. You'll get that one right. And you'll be right back to where, where you are. So, yeah. Do you have any other, other thoughts on this one, Erica? I mean, exactly that. Um, just to, to know that this is false and that it's okay to miss questions in the first five to 10. Um, and in, in fact, to expect to. 
I, I try to tell my students that it's more important to get your timing right from the jump um, than to get all of these right. So if you have to guess on literally the first question on the section, that is okay. Um, just don't dig yourself a hole because I find that when students are really, really behind, one, they don't finish the section, which is like actually quite bad for your score um, or they get so stressed out about their time management that they end up getting in kind of a, a, a mental funk and their performance isn't as great on the rest of the section which is more than five to ten questions so right yeah good point Yep. Yeah, exactly. So this is a myth, myth busted. <laughs> Approach the first five to 10 questions as you would the rest of the section. All right, let's move on to myth number two. And as we're going through these, if you have any follow-up questions on these myths, or if you have another thing that you've heard that you're not sure is true, feel free to throw those in the chat and we'll be addressing some of these questions and other myths uh, at the end of the live stream. So please throw those in the chat. All right. GMAT myth number two, I need to get almost all of the questions right on test day to get a high score. Uh, I see this one a lot in my YouTube comments. Uh, I see a lot of people who are really concerned with accuracy, who are saying, I only get 75% of these questions right in practice. And they're really worked up about that. And I have to tell them that that's actually maybe not the biggest deal in the world. Uh, do you hear this one a lot, Eric? Yeah, absolutely. And it makes sense, you know, because of the way that we all tested growing up, right? You, you, your, your teacher hands out a test to you or, you know, everybody gets the same test on a, you know, on a computer and it's, it's the same exact questions. And therefore in the end, it's how many you got right and how many you got wrong. And so, you know, makes sense. If you want to get a high score, you have to get the majority of the questions right. But again, as this is a computer adaptive test, right? It's built for you, right? So ultimately everyone will get questions that are at some point will be consistently challenging for them. So even people like Erica, right? Who scores super high on the test at some point, we're gonna hopefully get up to where we can start to pin her a little bit and we'll start to try to uh, give her questions that maybe are a little bit higher, a little bit stronger than even she can handle. I can't imagine there's a whole lot of those, but the point is even somebody who gets an 800 still gets questions wrong. Absolutely. And I can confirm that on my test day, there were some questions that were really hard. And, you know, even if they were something that I, I maybe could have answered if I was sitting down at my desk, relaxed with a little snack on test day, they were really hard and it just wasn't occurring to me. And I had to guess and move on. 99th percentile score, you're still going to be hitting those harder questions. Um, so this seems like a good time to go through the algorithm and what makes this test so different from most other tests out there. Yeah, that'd be great. So yeah, if we can, um, so there you go. So this is we sort of look at first question to last question. And if you think about sort of easy to hard questions and how they're scored, right, that those would, would um, uh, be comparable, right, Many makes sense. So the harder the question, the, the higher the score. And so, um, you know, in this situation, mainly what this is what we do with every candidate, right? So we serve up a middle tier question to everyone. So that's what that little white dot is over there. And so let's just say that you're nervous, which makes perfect sense. A lot of people are going to, you know, they, they feel comfortable when they're at home, but now all of a sudden they're in a test center and they've had a check in, they've, they've, you know, just want to sort of get into their, their groove, but they're probably not quite into it until they get into a few questions. So you might get this question wrong, even though you normally would have gotten this question right. So we're going to then serve up another question to you that's going to be a little bit easier. And when, um, uh, you know, again, you may still be nervous. You may even get that question wrong um, or you may get it right. So here you got it. You got it wrong. And then finally, we get you to a question where you're going to get the one right. And so now we're going to give you a harder question. Um, and then you're going to start to move up and that little white dot would have normally been moving up and down here, you know, to kind of show you that you're getting a harder and harder question. And then we continue. Um, and we're ultimately going to get up to a level where you're going to start getting a question right, get a question wrong. And we're going to continue that until the very end. So we continue to try to uh, figure out exactly where you are. So if you can kind of see this pattern, again, you started out at a medium level, you got some questions wrong, you normally would have gotten right. You finally get down to something that, you know, maybe helps you just calm down a little bit. And then you're going to move up to your level. And then maybe you're maybe a little higher than your level, then a little lower. And then you're going to continue to try to pin you. 
And so what we give to the schools though, and what we give to you is that upper bracket, right? So it's really which questions that you consistently answer correctly that's gonna impact your score. So again, it's not how many questions you got right and how many you got wrong. It's really about which questions you got right on a consistent basis. So I have a question for you, Eric, just to kind of confirm that what I'm sharing with my students is, is accurate because kind of the reductive thing that I share is that your score is a reflection of the difficulty where you're getting about half of them right and half of them wrong. So students should expect that if they're performing at their level, which is their, their score level on test day, they should expect to miss around 50% of questions. Would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. And that's, that can be kind of the, the challenge and it's where you need to kind of stay within yourself. Um, because again, it's not, it's not as positive reinforcing, you know, to have that kind of experience. So I always tell people that, you know, at some point you're going to start to feel like every question it's challenging, but doable. Um, and you may actually feel like it's a little bit more challenging than doable, but the point is um, we're trying to get it up to where it's uh, again, at your level, you know, and again, everyone's going to have the same feeling kind of at the end but where they actually are feeling that are very different. So what Erica tests at is gonna be a very different level than where I test at, which would probably be very, very low. So, um, and obviously the average county is gonna be in that kind of 500 range where, you know, Erica's, you know, getting close to that, you know, 800 range. And I'm probably close to that 200 range. So. <laughs> I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit. <laughs> um, well, thank you, this is super helpful. Um, yeah, I think that that this is a this is a tough pill to swallow for a lot of my students, especially students who are perfectionists, maybe students who have tested well in the past and for whom this structure is 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 challenging, especially because they can't skip questions. I know for me, when I started on this exam and, and I have a test prep background, I've been working in test prep for a long time and I'd, I'd been working with um, the SAT and the ACT in particular before moving to the GMAT where I really struggled with that concept of, of not being able to skip a question, right? Because I'd be sitting there going, I don't want to miss this. And I think if I came back to it, I could do it. And just that, for me, that knowledge that I can miss half of the questions, uh, as long as I'm, I'm getting roughly at, at my level, was so freeing to, yeah. to go, it's fine, move on. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. more important for me to finish this section than to get this one right. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and certainly, you know, guess when appropriate, right? That's part of um, what's going on here. I mean, if it makes you feel any better, this allows for a shorter test, um, but still at an exceptionally high level of reliability and what those scores mean and how valid they are in predicting your academic success within, you know, business schools, right? So, so in other words, like with the SAT, if you had taken it, in person, you notice they're now going to uh, completely, you know, through a computer-based um, version. But anyway, the point is, if if we're trying to 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 get an accurate score, right? So you want an accurate score. The schools you're applying to want an accurate score, and all the subscores and so forth. You know, we have to give you appropriate level questions. Well, if you were just taking it on paper, we'd have to give you a bunch of really easy ones. We'd have to give you a bunch of really hard ones. We'd have to give you a bunch in the middle because we don't know where you are, but this allows us to more quickly get there. And therefore you have hopefully a better testing experience. It makes it more accurate. It also makes it more secure. I mean, there's lots of benefits, you know, to this. So, yeah. Absolutely. And that's such a good point that, that there really is a benefit, <laughs> which is not having to sit down and test for seven hours, which I know for me, <laughs> that's, that's a relief. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and move on to GMAT myth number three. And this is actually really closely related. The best way to improve my score is to study the hardest questions. And I hear this one a lot. I hear this one. <laughs> do you hear this one too? I do, but, but you probably hear it all the time because obviously that's why people are coming to you. But, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'd be curious what you, what you tell people. Oh, absolutely. I, I see this one on forums. I see this one in YouTube comments. I see this one from my students. And I see it from these students who are massively frustrated because they're working on these, these questions that are, you know, 700 level, 750 level, and they're, they're really struggling with them. And they're trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. And then they're testing and they're scoring hundreds of points lower. And they're going, why I'm working with these questions that are so hard. 
And the truth is that it all comes back to this idea that the GEMA is a computer adaptive exam. The, the idea that I really try to instill with my students is that if you are missing questions at say the 400 level or the 500 level consistently, right? You can miss one or two here and there, right? And that's fine. Um, but if you're missing them consistently, that test is going to try to pin you at that 400 to 500 level. It's going to go, that's your level, that's you. And so you won't see those 700, 750 level questions. So even if you can answer them, it doesn't matter because you're missing those questions at that lower difficulty level. And that's where the test is going to place you. So what I try to recommend to my students is to take a personalized approach to their prep and think about what are the questions that are the lowest difficulty that I'm missing. So for instance, on the verbal section, what I recommend is when you take a practice test is to look and go, how many of each type of question am I missing? If I'm missing like two reading comprehension and a lot more sentence correction, it's sentence correction that is pulling that difficulty down, right? Because you're performing maybe at less than 50% correct on sentence correction and more on reading comprehension. So I would say focus on sentence correction, raise that up to the level of reading comprehension, then you can start to spread, spread the wealth in terms of your study. Um, so that's my suggestion is to really try to, to hone and focus on the lowest difficulty ones you're consistently getting wrong. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, um, I did ask some of the psychometricians uh, at JMAC about this. I mean, these are, you know, even just their title, you can tell how, how smart these people are, right? So much more <laughs> than me. But anyway, you know, what they recommended was, you know, try to find the difficulty levels where you're getting, you know, roughly 50% of them correct and 50% right. So to kind of come back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, and then also, of course, think about, a, you know, much like what Erica just mentioned, right? That there are certain types of questions or certain sections where you're just not, you know, doing as well there, that's where you have the most opportunity to improve your score, right? If you only practice what are your strengths, sure, you can improve your score maybe a little bit, right? But if you're able to improve those areas where you have more weaknesses or haven't had, you know, mainly you haven't had as much exposure to it um, and you just need a little bit of help navigating those questions um, and ultimately get, you know, build up your confidence, that's where you're going to have the most opportunity to improve your scores. So. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the concept of prepping at your level is, again, it's a tough pill to swallow, especially if you are aiming for, for a high, high score. But if you're not there yet, it's not helpful to focus on that level because that, that's not the exam experience you'll have. Work your way yeah. up. Is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. I'll just, and I'll just throw this out there because mm -hmm. I always look at, you know, taking something like the GMAT as a, a great investment for getting you ready for business school, right? And so part of what I've always, you know, I've seen with business school students is that when they go into business school, there, there's a reason why they go. They don't know everything. They're not strong at everything. And when they're on a learning team and there's a project that is served up to that team, you will find on a very consistent basis that people will volunteer for the things that are going to make them the most uncomfortable, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where they, those are the things they need to learn. So if they're not a marketing person, they might say, hey, I'll take that marketing part or we have to present this to, you know, in class, well, can I take the lead on presenting? Because that's something I haven't done as much. And I'd like to do that. Or can I try crunching the data first? Because I don't have an opportunity to crunch data as much. And then obviously you can, you know, lean on your classmates, you know, to, to help you. But um, anyway, I think this is, again, that's sort of that first step towards getting uncomfortable with, yeah, I don't know everything. I have, I have areas to improve. Wow, that's such a that's such a useful perspective and and not one that that I'd considered before just because I, I don't know much about business school. I haven't been myself. I'm I'm a I'm a GMAT gal <laughs> through yeah. and through. Um, yeah. But that's that's really, really useful. I, I get I do get a lot of questions for students being like, you know, and I've seen some of them in the in the comments already with like, why do I have to take this? You know, and, and we can get more into that later. But I think sure. that that's that's so valuable to think like the experience of the test of that being uncomfortable is something that B schools value and that are valuable for, for you. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have people from all over the world, from all different backgrounds with all different strengths, and you're going to be challenged in all different ways. And, you know, that's going to help get you ready for, for school and for life. And yeah, it's might as well go ahead and start, right? It's uh, if you just stick with your strengths, where do you end up? Right. I mean, so 
Love that. All right, moving on to GMAT myth number four. So this actually ties back to these questions that we've talked about so far with that algorithm. And, and this is one that I, I get often as a follow-up after I've shown kind of like, okay, if you get this one wrong, then okay, next question, a little bit lower difficulty, and then it moves up and down. And students go, so does that mean if I'm taking the test and I get a question and I go, wow, that was so easy. Does mm -hmm. that mean that I got the previous question wrong? Yeah, most of the time, but let's let's show the myth yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah not necessarily right so um we do come things that maybe you know are kind of interesting you know experiences that we have right so we may be changing content on you right and that is type of content that you perceive as easier right so now all of a sudden you think oh well, this is an easier question i must have gotten the last one wrong and the problem with that is that now you may be throwing yourself off because you may be thinking, am I not thinking about these questions correctly and that sort of thing? Nope. You know, it's just, you know, again, it's some content maybe that you, you know, perceive as a little bit easier. The other little piece, which maybe you don't hear about as much, is that we have to test our items in a live environment, right? So you can only do so much testing, you know, through, you know, various, you know, ways to figure out where a, a particular item should be scored or within a particular range of scores. And so ultimately we have to put this, put some of those questions into a live environment, meaning they're going to show up on your exam. Not a lot, just a few here and there, right? Um, and so these are non-scoring questions. They will not impact you at all. Um, but again, uh, they might, you, it might be that you get a question where, you know, 80% of people that test at your level normally get this question right. So of course you're going to then perceive that as an easier question. So yeah. Anyway, yeah, most of the time, true. Not always. <laughs> That's, I, I love to hear you say that it, it's most of the time true because typically I say to my students, like the algorithm is like so complicated and, <laughs> you know, and, and maybe, maybe it is true in most cases, which is, which is interesting. Um, but I think that the thing that I say to students is that, you know, you're not a psychometrician and it's not your job to be a psychometrician and it's not helpful on test day for you to be a psychometrician. If you're up in your head going, oh, well, if I got that one wrong, then I need to get this one right. Blah, blah, blah. If you're thinking those things, it's distracting you from the thing at hand, which is working on the problem, you know, which is thinking about your time management, which is approaching the test, right? And so regardless of if you got the previous question wrong or right, high chance you're just incorrect in your interpretation because you're not a psychometrician. Um, but even if you're right, it doesn't matter. What's done is done and it's not helpful. It doesn't serve you in moving forward in that section. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you don't want these sort of things are distracting you as you're moving through and letting your emotions get to you, right? So, I mean, I think that's one of the things like why on the practice exams that you can get through the free software that you have the option of flagging whether or not you're guessing on that particular question. Now you can't do that on the real exam, right? But when you're going through the practice exam, you're, you know, again, cause there's gonna be a lot of times you're like, oh, I think I got it, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Is it between this question or that question or that answer, that answer? then you can guess. And what you'll see at the end is you probably do pretty well, right? So all of that is to help you build your confidence, right? So again, hopefully you don't get distracted by a lot of these things. You just kind of stay within yourself, do the best you can. And it is what it is in the end. I, I love a flag tool so much. <laughs> I use it so much with my students um, and, and self-studiers can, can use it as well. Um, there, there's so much benefit. This doesn't really fit in with any of our myths, but there's so much benefit to taking practice tests on your own and taking them regularly. Even if you're not fully like, oh, I've got everything and I'm totally ready. Just practicing taking the test, getting comfortable with that test, getting comfortable with making mistakes, with timing yourself, with guessing is, is so critical to your performance on test day. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like a dress rehearsal, right? Why not go ahead and give yourselves as many, you know, opportunities as you can to do that. And that way you just kind of get into your zone as they say, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Moving on to myth number five. This one's fun. Whichever section has a lower score is the section I'm performing worse on. Uh, and this is one that, um, 
<laughs> I love this question because this is one, or this myth, this is one that I see from a lot of students um, who, who come to me because they go, I, my score in verbal is in the 30s. My mm. score in quant is in the 40s. And I have been prepping and prepping and prepping and prepping and prepping and prepping on verbal. And I just can't get it to the point I'm at in quant. What gives? Or maybe I am improving my verbal, but it's just, it's not having the impact on the overall score that I'm expecting. And I have to break the news to them that probably they've been studying entirely wrong, that they have been dedicating their study in a manner that's pretty unwise. Because an interesting thing about the way this exam is scored, and Eric, maybe you have a little more context on this, um, is that both of these sections are scored on the same scale. They're both scored from six to 51. Mm -hmm. However, these sections test totally different things and students perform totally differently on them. And as a result, those scores are not comparable in the least. So what a 40 means on quant is not at all what a 40 means on verbal. Right. So I have a slide here that I want to show that really demonstrates this. And this is taken directly from the, the GMAC website, cribbed it. <laughs> so what we can see here is if you look kind of in the middle here, that the average score on quant is a 40.7. So that's the 50th percentile. That means that 50% of students are scoring above, 50% of students are scoring below. The 50th percentile for verbal is a 27.26. Now that doesn't mean that students are performing worse on verbal. I, I think that's the way a lot of people interpret it is that verbal is the harder section and people are scoring worse. That's not what it means. It just means that these scales can be interpreted differently. Yeah. So if we take a look here, for instance, at say 41, a 41 for quant is a 37th percentile. So that's, um, th that's a little bit lower, right? If we look for verbal, we got 41, it's a 94th percentile. So that means that's a very high score for verbal. So the takeaway here, to go back to this previous slide, is that if you are self-studying, if you are building your own study schedule, use percentile rankings for those individual sections to determine how you're performing. The raw score is not particularly helpful from a diagnostic perspective, but also for, um, for you personally. <laughs> um, so take a look at those percentiles and then focus on that section where you're performing worse to bring up that score. Yeah, Eric, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I was, I mean, just kind of back to my admissions days, um, you know, the, you know, percentiles are really about how you rank compared to other people mm -hmm. that take up whatever it is that you're being compared to, right? So in this case, these percentiles are simply of people who take the GMAT score, how many of them score uh, in that sort of 41 and above, let's say, for that example, and then, you know, on the, on the quant and how many of them do that on the verbal section. So I think what it shows is that, you know, makes sense, more people that are going to take the GMAT probably have a little bit more comfort level with the quant section, right? Because, you know, when you go to business school, there's going to be quant, there's going to be, um, you know, and just looking at the backgrounds of, of candidates that apply. So yeah, there's more in a sense competition there from a, from a quant standpoint than from a verbal standpoint. Mm -hmm. If there's sort of a different type of grad program, it might be the complete opposite. So yeah. Now how schools look at that is that they will use both, right? So they will look mm -hmm. at the total score, which is going to be consistent from year to year to year to year to year, right? So if they say, look, we've been able to see that people who have struggled are below a certain score, right? The percentile they'll have to adjust over time, depending on how the applicant pool changes or how the, the GMAT pool changes, right? So, but we always provide three-year averages. In fact, the data that Erica, you, you were showing were obviously three-year averages and they don't change dramatically from, you know, year to year, obviously, but, but nevertheless, um, it's just important to, to put that in the, the right context. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question um, kind of related to this myth and a, a piece of advice that I I've given students and that I, I, I know a lot of other test prep providers give students is to try to aim for a, a balanced score for admission. So this is getting a little bit into admissions territory. Sure. So sure. if someone is weaker in, in verbal to ideally try to pull it up a little closer to quant, if someone's weaker in quant to ideally try to pull that up a little closer to verbal, what, what do you think? 
Sure. I mean, I, that, I mean, that's good advice in terms of, you know, you don't want to have red flags for the school, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, it's the same thing with the subsections, like the integrated reasoning section, right, which is, you know, not included in the total score, right? So if that's, you know, really low, you know, maybe that, that sets off a little bit of an alarm bell. But more importantly, when they see higher scores on a particular subsection, they kind of go, oh, we can, we can point to that. That might help to offset some of the, the lower scores maybe we're seeing in, in something else. Mm -hmm. um, but every school and every program is going to maybe emphasize different things with their admissions committee in terms of what they know about how people have performed on these kinds of tests and how they do in the program. I mean, the, the GMAT is the most predictive uh, piece of an application in terms of pr predicting your academic performance, right? Unless you're coming right out of undergrad and then your grades, I think at undergrad and your courses you took there will be uh, probably equally um, as predictive, but some schools will focus more on the quant section, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't hear as many schools focus on the verbal section, mm -hmm. um, but but nevertheless, um, if they see it's, it's really low there, um, you know, maybe that has some thoughts of, well, how, what about their English skills? Right. Um, and that's where they're going to read the analytical writing assessment for sure, not just for your ability to break down an argument, but also just look at your command of English language, right? But actually reading the the text. Um, and then obviously if you're not a native speaker, you're taking another, you're taking an actual English test, which, you know, the GMAT is not measuring your English skills, right? Those are, there are other tests for that. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think this, this, this is something that we're going to touch on a little bit later, but you know, how, how the, your GMAT journey and your admissions journey is going to be, you know, it's going to be school specific. It's going to be personal. Um, so the, the generalized advice doesn't always quite work. I, I tend to recommend that it's, it's typically easier to get questions that are lower difficulty, right? <laughs> like it's easier to make those, those lower percentile improvements um, than it is to make the, the higher percentile ones. But again, yeah, it, it, it is going to be specific. If your school is looking for you to demonstrate a quantitative proficiency that you don't demonstrate anywhere else, maybe you should focus on the quant section. Um, so yeah, I, I super appreciate that perspective that, you know, you want to personalize it to your exam performance, but you also want to personalize it to your personal MBA journey. Yep. All right. Moving on. Yeah. GMAT myth number six. Uh, yeah. This is a great one. The GMAT requires advanced math knowledge. I'm going to kick that to you, Eric. Yeah, you don't. Um, this is this is not college level math. This really is high school level math. So, um, uh, you know, probably around at least going back to my high school days, probably around you know ninth, tenth grade, right? So, algebra, a little bit of geometry, and then you kind of get into, you know, looking at, um, obviously we're looking at some logic and some analytical reasoning, um, you know, um, and so, you know, um, yeah, it's not, it's not calculus, it's not, uh, you know, college level, you know, advanced math, things like that. So it's really about how you apply these skills. I think that's the, um, the you know, the, a little bit of the, the challenging part. So, you know, the best thing for candidates, obviously, is, you know, some of us that have maybe been out for a while just need to dust the cobwebs off a little bit and learn some of those basic skills again um, and just start to think more analytically uh, mm -hmm. when you're looking at questions. And, you know, again, obviously this plays out in business school and in work because um, a lot of times you're not always asked for the precise number. It's really, you know, give me a ballpark or what's the, you know, give me a range, you know, is it, mm -hmm. you know like a business. Are we talking about making a hundred dollars here? Are we talking about a hundred million dollars here, right? So, where are we within a particular range rather than, you know, again, spending days and days and days going and figuring out, well, you know, the potential of this is X, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, pretty, pretty basic um, math skills in, in that regard, high school level. And again, for a lot of people that need to, to kind of go back and dust those cobwebs off. So. Yeah. yeah I, I, I love that you brought up the two things that I was going to bring up, which is one, that while this, this math knowledge might not be advanced, it might be something you haven't seen in, in yeah. a minute. I find that most people, especially like with geometry, that's, there, there's a lot of little rules and there's a lot, of, a lot of little things that when you know them provide this excellent foundation for you know, logic and piecing together information and building on things you know to reach a conclusion. And it, it provides an amazing 
a testing tool of critical thinking of logic, but you have to know that foundation. <laughs> and so that, that, that you do need to dust off the cobwebs is important. You know, it is this test of logic, but they need something. You need something to test the logic with. And sometimes that's something you may not remember particularly well. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I always think about these candidates that are, you know, going into a, a business school and they're going to be writing some, you know, potentially some pretty big checks to not only go to school, but they might be going full time. So they're leaving a job. They may be moving mm -hmm. a family, things like that. I mean, these are not small investments um, on a lot of levels. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're better off spending the time now mm -hmm. to use some of these things so that when you get to business school, you're not spending all your time in the library trying to, you know, figure out this stuff. Cause you're going to want to network and you're going to want to go to sessions and you're going to want to, you know, spend the extra time with, you know, doing all kinds of other things other than studying. Right. right. The, Absolutely. The basics, yeah. I think this also ties into, to, um, something that I, I raise to my students a lot, especially, um, students at all levels where I think, I think some students have again, that perspective that they might develop for like SAT or ACT or another exam where, you know, something is an advanced math concept. And so if they're, you know, if they're really prioritizing their time correctly, maybe they just won't touch that one and they'll go, I'll, I'll just skip those questions or I'll just guess on those questions because it's only a few of them. But yeah. it's important to know that because of the way the GMAT works and because of what it tests, it's not so much that it's, it's the concept that's what raises the difficulty of the question. It's the complexity of that question. So what I try to tell my students is, yeah, maybe you don't know a ton about, you know, combinatorics or probability, some of the maybe less commonly known concepts on this exam. But if you just do a primer to just get a foundation on what that means, the rest is logic, right? So you need to build that foundation kind of regardless of where you are. And, and how you're performing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's so, again, I keep coming back to this investment, like getting yourself ready for business school. And I just, I can just envision you working with your, with your candidates on this and, and how you're helping them so much just to get ready and how, you know, even those SAT type candidates, right. You know, the high school kids that, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, just by going through this, they're going to be so much better prepared when they get there you know, to do well. Right. And if they're not struggling in class, they're having more fun. They're more confident. They're willing to take more risk. You know, it's all those kinds of things. So again, I, I wouldn't look at this as just, okay, I have to take this exam. This is really, again, a good investment of my time, getting me ready for the next stage, you know, of, of what I'm trying to do here with my life. So, yeah. 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 It's such a useful perspective. I think one that for me just slips through the cracks so often. So this is just such a good yeah. Such That'll a good sense. reminder. <laughs> no, makes sense. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. All right. GMAT myth number seven. This is our second to last myth. I need a super high score to get into my business school of choice. And we were kind of maybe hinting at this one earlier. So Eric, I'm going to kick this to you. Yeah. And again, um, just again, in, in what I currently do, I talk with admissions offices all the time. And I used to work in an MBA admissions for nearly a decade. And I worked in undergrad admissions for, I don't know, six, seven years or so. And you're going to constantly hear these admissions people talk about a holistic, holistic admissions process, right? Which means that they're looking at your entire application, right? They're also looking at your situation. So where, you know, what is your background, right? What have you been exposed to? Where should we expect to see strengths? Where should we expect to see weaknesses, right? So, and they're gonna, they're gonna calibrate that with them when looking at things like scores, right? So, um, you know, um, I, you know the, and the thing that the schools always tell me uh, as well, and again, I preached it, you know, when I was in MBA admit, or when I was in admissions all the way around, is that, you know, be careful with averages, right? There's a tendency for, it's a real nice, easy, clean thing to look at, uh, the rankings love to publish them, you know, people put them on their school profiles and so forth, but they also put ranges, mid 80% ranges, mid 50% ranges. All of those should tell you more about the class that entered rather than necessarily the group that applied, but definitely is an indication of, you know, who got admitted to some degree. Um, but it, there's so many other intangibles to the application process that you, you know, again, there's a tendency people to get fixated on numbers and how they compare. 
Um, and the biggest concern that, it, that admissions offices have is when someone tries to rule themselves out mm-hmm. at a school, even though it's a, they're one of their, it's a dream school for them. And they think, oh, I'm 30 points below their, their average. There's no way I'm going to get in. So I'm not going to apply. Right? Mm-hmm. Every admissions officer in the world just would beg you, no, please don't do that. <laughs> if you really think we're a great fit, apply, right? This is just one piece. And it just helps us with, you know, whether or not you're going to be prepared. And if we have some really, really tough choices to make, sure, this will be one of the many factors that we factor in to, to make some tough choices because we can't admit every qualified, you know, compelling candidate, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. So. I feel like so many students, even though I know they know the concept of averages because it's tested on this exam. I feel like so often when folks interpret school averages, they're like, that's the threshold. I need to be there to get in. And an average means that 50% of students are scoring at or above and 50% half are scoring at or below. Maybe you're in that lower 50%. You can still get in because again, half of the students are at or below that. So I, I, I really, I'm totally with you. Don't disqualify yourself. There's, there's no reason to, you know, if you can, if you can do the application and there are other things in your application that are strong, you could absolutely be going to that school. You know, and one of the things that's kind of interesting, and, and this is just the experience that I've had, so I can't say this across the board for everybody, but for candidates who are waitlisted, now I don't want to put mm. necessarily connect scores to you're going to end up on the waitlist, but the bottom line is candidates that um, end up on the waitlist for any particular reason are just not there. Maybe their application just wasn't as compelling. It doesn't mean that they was, as a candidate aren't as compelling. It might be that their application wasn't as compelling. Maybe you didn't have as much time. Maybe you didn't mm. prep as much. Maybe you didn't have time to think through why am I really doing this? You know, um, Maybe you know your your work experience is just a little bit less compelling than some other candidates, and maybe the admissions committee didn't understand it as well because you know right. The bottom line is, um, and I saw this with with high, uh, high school kids going into college, they end up on the wait list. When they get there, they actually perform better mm. academically than those who were not on the wait list. And part of that is this sort of like, I'm going to prove it to you. Right? Mm-hmm. You let me in eventually, and I'm not. I want to make sure you don't, um, or that you you can, you can say that was a good decision. So, anyway, that's so interesting. I feel like that also that also ties back to kind of the the test prep reason why this myth is so dangerous. I I find that a lot of students who just have that goal of I'm going to score as high as I can. That's not a productive goal. You don't know when to stop. And because you don't have something concrete that you're aiming for, I find that students with those kind of like nebulous, super high score goals don't study as much or they don't study in a in a dedicated way, in a way that's going to help them as much because they don't know what they're shooting for. They don't know what they have to do to achieve that goal. And that can result in spending less time with the other elements of the application, which are important as well, which, which can lead to reduced results. Yeah. And you, you really want to think about why you're doing this, right? So mm. why do you want to go to business school? Why that particular school? Why now? Right. Um, you know, uh, again, make sure you've got things lined up at home, you know, and in your personal life and things like that, make sure you got your finances in order and all of that. And if you're spending all your time just trying to get a, a, a super high score, right. Because you think that's, that's the ticket. Um, you're really, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Um, you're missing out on, on, you know, again, some, some great investment on your part. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right. Last GMAT myth. The GMAT is harder than the GRE. I know I've heard this one. Have you heard this one, Eric? All the time. So (laughs) yeah. All right, Eric, what do you think about this one? Well, I think, I think it all, it, it, right, there you go, right? It's all about an, an individual strengths and weaknesses, right? So, you know, the GMAT is really, you know, the gold standard, you know, when you're applying to business school, right? It's, it's the one that's been, was created by, you know, a group of schools, a group of deans that got together, you know, 70 years or so ago and said, we want an exam that really fits, you know, business schools. And so it was developed from there and it always has been, it's always focused on, what people are going to be exposed to when they get to business school. So obviously the, the quant is probably going to be a little bit more challenging, right. Than you know, other assessments that are out there. Um, so, but again, if, if your strengths are on the, the quant, 
part, you probably think GMAT's a little bit easier, right? Uh, if it's, you know, if your verbal isn't quite as strong, you may, might think the GMAT is, is, is harder, or the Vigiri is harder. I mean, so it, it really depends on each individual. But what, what's been your experience, Erica? Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm with you that it, it really does depend. I think that the GMAT gets that reputation of being the harder test, partially because that quant section is so competitive. Um, yeah. But also because of the adaptive nature of the exam. I think that, you know, students are, are going into, you know, the GMAT versus the GRE, and maybe they have literally the same percentile on both exams, but they might feel a little bit like, oh, I didn't do as well on the GMAT because I missed half of the questions. Whereas on the GRE, maybe I only missed a few, whereas it's the same performance. So yeah. I think it, it, it comes down to maybe a, a misunderstanding of how that test is structured. Um, so what I recommend to students is first, talk to your schools, you know, talk to um, admissions committees, call the admissions office, see if, that, if your school does have a preference for the GMAT or the GRE, or if, you know, any scholarships you're looking at have a preference, make sure that the test you're taking fits your goals, right? It, it, it's not great to take an exam that doesn't match your goals. And then once you have that, if you go, okay, I really can take either exam, there are some things that I, I recommend as guidelines. You know, if you're a bit of a perfectionist, maybe that, that GMAT <laughs> algorithm might give you a little bit of grief, but I'm living proof you can get over it. <laughs> um, if you struggle a little bit more with quant, GRE might be a better bet. If you maybe struggle more with like vocab or, or English, then maybe you might aim for GMAT. But my big recommendation is take a practice test. If you have time, take a GMAT practice test one weekend, take a GRE practice test another weekend. Don't try to take them back to back. <laughs> it's not going to work well. And then compare your percentiles and then choose the one you're performing better at and invest your attention there. I see that a lot of students try to do both exams. I do not recommend that because that's splitting your attention and likely splitting your score improvement. They don't want to see a slight improvement on both exams. They'd rather see a big improvement on one exam. Yeah, I think it's I think that's good advice. Um, I, I will say probably you're going to find more schools now that say uh, we're agnostic, right? So, yeah. um, but I think what I think your your point about the scholarship part is an important one. It it also has an impact on um, which industries you're looking to go into, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes some of the um, like consulting and finance, investment banking, things like that, they will ask for your GMAT score. That's what they're used okay. to. Now that may change over time as more candidates take a GRE going to, to business school, but you, know, you got to factor that in a little bit. Um, but I have, I have, um, you know, and I very much believe this, but it's not just because I work for GMAC, but I've read this from a lot of, um, you know, test prep folks um, like Erica and, and all the great work that they do is that if you're looking to go to business school, you know, the GMAT is the thing that it's the kinds of things you have to prepare for to take the GMAT are going to better prepare you for business school, right? Mm -hmm. Then uh, the GRE, right? Um, so just a, a little bit there, again, looking at this as an investment of your of your time. Um, and, you know, it, and, and in a way it does kind of tell the school, look, I'm really serious about business school, right? So, you know, this is the test that, you know, the vast majority of people are taking to get into business school. Now that may change over time, right? But there's still that signal of, you know, are you really sure you're committed to going to business school, right? And so, yeah. So anyway, yeah. there's some, yeah. some other thoughts there. Yeah, it all comes down to your strength and weaknesses in the end, right? And what your comfort level is with things. Yeah. Yes. So appreciate your perspective, Eric. Yeah. Well, that is it for the myths that we have prepped. Uh, thank you again so much, Eric. I, I, I learned a lot today. I hope that our viewers learned a lot as well. And if you're joining us after the fact, um, I hope you learned stuff too. Um, at this time, we have about 10 minutes left in our stream to answer questions from you. Um, I'm seeing some questions already in the chat. Uh, if you're joining us after the fact, you can throw questions in the comments and we check those, we respond to them. So we're happy to answer questions there. But if you are with us live, please throw any questions or myths that you have in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start at the top with one that we got before we went live because I love this one. Um, oh, where'd it go? 
Oh, I lost it. So I'm going to, I'm going to just say approximately what I heard, uh, what I remember from that question, which was why does the GMAT test grammar? How is knowing whether an indefinite program is a program pronoun is singular or plural going to help me in business school? And I know what I would tell a student yeah. on this, but uh, Eric, what, what would you say? Why does the GMAT? Oh. Well, I'm, I'm really curious as to what your answer is, but you know, I would just say first, um, you know, you need to be able to write well and speak well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to be successful in school and also after you get out of school, uh, just those are really important skills to have. So sometimes just dusting the cobwebs off with your grammar um, is just a smart move. Um, so this will kind of force the issue a little bit um, because we don't always have a lot of free time to say, oh, I should do this. You know, well, okay, let's force the issue a little bit. Um, what I do think is kind of interesting is that non-native English speakers typically do a little bit better on those questions than native English speakers. And I think that's because native speakers go with what sounds right, which is different than what is correct. So. I love that. That, that is so interesting. And it, it so aligns with exactly what I try to teach about the sentence correction uh, problem type. I, I really like the way the GMAT test sentence correction um, compared to, you know, some other exams compared to some other grammar based uh, things out there. Because I, I think a lot of students go into sentence correction thinking that it's all going to be idioms, it's all going to be diction, it's all going to be things where it's these really specific roles and they have to memorize this you know, 5,000 word or phrase list of things that you would only know if, you know, you've been speaking English for a really long time. And that's, that's not what's going on in, in sentence correction. So what, what I do is I try to compare sentence correction to geometry. Actually, I find that they are very similar problem types and that mm -hmm. geometry, are you going to be dealing with shapes a whole ton in business school? No, probably not. Um, but it's a set of predefined rules a limited set of rules that you can learn. And once you have those rules, they allow to build this incredible logical game on top of it, right? This, this ability that, to, to test your critical reasoning skills using those rules. So they, they provide the scaffolding for what the problem really tests, which is, um, which is logic, which is critical thinking. And I feel the same way about, um, about sentence correction, where yeah. it is, it's logic, right? It's how you approach this question. It's, do you approach it by reading and sounding out every answer choice? Or do you approach it by, okay, well, what are the differences here? Right? What are the, the things that I notice about these answer choices? Oh, let me focus there. Well, what does that remind me of? What's the clue? Right? How can I simplify the sentence? There's the problem. Right? And you need rules <laughs> to be able to do that. But it's a limited set. And so if you have that limited foundation of knowledge, you get to display your, your logic and your, your critical thinking in a really cool way. Yeah, that's that's great advice. It's funny because I have a, I have something on my bulletin board right here. This is, talks about style guide, right? And mm. there are some other things on the other side which talk about you know, um, you know, when do you use certain words, for instance, mm. and when do you don't use other words and things like that. So, again, it's um, I think having some of those rules obviously is is really important because it's, you know, people are going to be reading your stuff. You're going to be speaking mm. publicly and so forth. You're trying to make a compelling argument. If people are so focused on they didn't use that word correctly or they, you know, um, they're misspelling this, all these typos. It just really takes away from your ability to be effective, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's definitely, there's multiple elements to it. It's, it's building that foundation of knowledge so that you can perform in business school. And then there's building that foundation of logic, which is also so critical. Yeah. 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 Um, but I love that question. Thanks for, for asking that. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Um, okay, I want to prep slowly over a long time, eight months. <laughs> what strategy would you suggest? Um, first, I would say, wow, <laughs> that's a long study timeline. Um, very impressive. Um, I would share to go in with structure. 
to go in with what's my score goal? Okay, where am I now? If you haven't taken a practice test as a diagnostic, do to, to figure out where you need to improve and how far you need to improve. And that can help inform how much you need to study as well as what you need to study. Where are you struggling the most? And then make a plan for, well, when am I gonna take my next practice test? Maybe it's gonna be in a month. Um, how much am I going to study a week? When am I going to study in the week? Am I going to do an error log to support my study and make sure it's valuable? I find that students who have really long study timelines are often like those students who have the, I want to score as high as I can <laughs> study goal in that it, they just kind of can study when it comes up and when they feel like it, which is rarely, <laughs> or maybe it's all weekend and then not again for five weeks. Go in with a plan, go in with structure because that time can tick away pretty quickly. And if you have this idea of, oh, I can always do next week, eventually you can't. <laughs> so go in with the plan would be my big suggestion. Um, Eric, do you have any thoughts? on a long study time? No, those are great. I mean, you know, you know this better than I do in terms of working, you know, with individual candidates and how, how they vary so much. I mean, obviously the amount of time that someone's going to have to, to study is their comfort level with the question types and, you know, the getting the pacing down and, and all of that. But I love your idea of just, you know, have a plan, be disciplined, stick to it. Um, I also loved what you said about find out what is in a sense, the target score for the particular programs that you're applying to. Um, and just to, to give you a small anecdotal story of that, my wife um, got her uh, MBA part time, right? So, oh, she, congrats! Yeah, so she was working full time. You know, she had her. You know, she was at a little different stage in her life. You know, she didn't want to go back full time. She felt that the full time students were a little young, right? They were a little bit more naive. You know, at this particular the local you know MBA programs that she was at, and she just connected more with the working professionals program and with those individuals. Well, anyway, she went around to, you know, do all the information sessions in the area. And there inevitably would be the question of what score should I target? Right. And for part-time programs, it was a little different than full-time where they have a lot more candidates that are applying uh, on the full-time side with a lot more people that are applying than maybe they have spots available, right. On the part-time side, it's maybe a little bit more, you know, as long as you're at a certain threshold, right. You know, you're likely more likely to get admitted. And so um, anyway, um, what they heard pretty consistently was, well, look, if you're around a 600 or above, right, then you're good to go, right, that, at the programs that she was looking at. And, you know, I would say just even having working at, you know, some of the, the best schools in the world, you know, being at sort of that 650, 600 to 650 range, you can handle the work, right? Mm -hmm. Then it just becomes a little bit of competition. But the bottom line is, to your point, she just started to study and she got comfortable with the question types and she thought, well, oh, let me just take a practice test and see where I am. Mm -hmm. She took it, she got a 720 or 730, I think wow. it did the first time. And she's like, well, that's good enough. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, she could have studied and who knows, you know, could she gotten a higher score? Probably she's a pretty bright person, right? And mm -hmm. she's disciplined and all that kind of stuff. So I'm sure um, her study would have been, you know, helpful and effective, but yeah, she's just like, that's all I needed. And that's exactly what she did. And she got into her school of choice and she had a great experience and never looked back. I love that. Yeah. That speaks to, to two things. One, the concept of good enough right? Do good enough. <laughs> you don't need to, you're not trying to make a career in test prep. You're trying to make a career in business. <laughs> so yeah. don't over invest, but also that idea of, yeah, practice tests early and often, not so often that you burn yourself out. You should yeah. study between them, <laughs> but right. I usually recommend every two weeks at the most frequent, um, mm -hmm. but at the least frequent, like once a month typically yeah. is, is what I recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more and then we're going to sign right off, which is what year should I take the GMAT? So pretty specific. They give a little more content, context. I'm in my first year aiming for the, I'm not familiar with this, the two plus two program yeah. at Harvard and Stanford. So Eric, I'm going to, I'm going to give that to you because this is not my wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the bottom line is that the test is valid for five years. And so, you know, you can take it and you can bank it, right? So, you know, always good to go ahead and take it, get it out of the way, focus on other things. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, a lot of people will say, if you're still an undergrad, go ahead and take it while you're an undergrad, 
right? Mm. Because especially in that sort of junior, senior year, again, if you're looking at the two, two programs, you know, um, that's where you're going to go work for two years and then you're going to be in the MBA program for two years. So, mm. you know, that's about. but anyway, so they're probably, probably that candidate is either a junior or senior uh, in college and they're looking at applying to those programs. And so, you know, maybe they're a junior, they're thinking, should I take it now or should I wait till my senior year? And I would just say, look, again, you have a five-year window, you know, mm-hmm. how on how valid they are and you're already in the study mode. Um, mm-hmm. So go ahead and do it. You know, when you, when you graduate and you start to work somewhere, um, you know, your time can get filled up with other things. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, the farther that you move away from your, you know, studying days, mm-hmm. it's probably a little more challenging to get back into your studying days, right? Yeah, the headspace so, is totally different. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, so great fully, answers. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no. I was just going to say it, it depends on each individual, right? To that point of, you know, you don't have to take it while you're an undergrad. You might want to say, yeah, okay, I'm going to wait a few years until I get out and decide if it's really something I want to do. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're in the study mode now and you got the time and space, go ahead and do it. It's good. You'll, you'll probably, you know, anyway, it's a good idea. Excellent. All right. Well, there are a few other questions that we did not get to. If we didn't get to your question, please feel free to throw those in the comments and we'll have someone from our team answer them for you. But thank you so much to everybody who is here. Thank you so much to Eric for joining us and giving us so many helpful pieces of advice and his uh, invaluable perspective on all of this. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you would like, please subscribe to our channel. We have videos like this coming out all the time. We have live streams with experts in the field like Eric and like our expert instructors. Um, we would love to hear more from you. And if you would like to visit us at Magoosh, we have our live online classes, which have recently started, where you can learn from an expert instructor. We got tutoring, we got our online program. So we have stuff that works for every type of study year. So if you're looking for some support, we have more stuff on our YouTube channel, more stuff on our blog, and we also have our Magoosh products. So would love to see you in there. All right. Thank you again so much, Eric. It was lovely to talk to you. You too. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.